Good morning. morning. No pressure, right? (laughs) Hey, I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad that the LEs are here. Isn't that what you guys are doing this summer? Literature evangelism? Yeah. Barb McCoy said, hey, look for the good-looking people in the red shirts. They're the coolest people in the room. So I'm glad that you are here. Hey, some of you, this is your first time back to church in a long time, some maybe a year, year and a half. Welcome home. I'm glad that you're here. Uh, Some of you probably, um, I don't know, you might have just heard, hey, something's happening at Forest Lake today. There's a big shindig happening in the gym. You might might go to a different church around the place. I don't know, Spring Meadows, it might be whole life. Hey, welcome home, you know, we'll grow the church one way or another. I'm kidding, y'all, just relax. (laughs) Uh, For those of you that are viewing online, hey, welcome. I'm glad that you're here as well. Also, um, there may be somebody here this morning that... I don't know, maybe God put something on your heart that, that you felt the urge to be a part of a church or go to, go to church today and you showed up at the front doors of the church sanctuary and you saw the signs that you might be your first time ever in a church today and it's in a gymnasium. And if that's you today, I'm glad that you are here. Welcome. It's been an awesome journey to come to Forest Lake. We've been excited about this. In fact, it's been a very long time happening. Uh, uh, Last November was when Pastor Orlando and I talked for the first time about the process, about the search for a senior pastor here at at Forest Lake, and it's a long time ago. I've been sitting on this for so long, but without a shadow of a doubt, I know God has called me and my family to this church for this time now. It's humbling. It's uh, an honor to be a part of this church with an incredible staff, with an incredible church family, and we are excited to be here. It already feels like home. But to be honest, uh, it's going to take a little bit of getting used to to Florida. It's a little different down here, y'all. You guys say y'all down here? Is that cool or no? Okay. Feels like home. I'm glad. You know, we, we don't want to even move yet. Our closing date up in, in Georgia is June 20, uh, July 21, and so we haven't moved. We're in a hotel right now. It's, it's fine. We're good. Uh, but I've been here a couple weeks on and off, house hunting and different things. I've learned some things about Florida. And if for you lifelong Floridians, you can laugh at me. It's okay. It's just the newbie that's got to learn some things as you go along. Here they are. There's three of them. Here's the first one. The first thing that I'm learning is that it feels like everything in Florida wants to kill you. (laughs) Maybe it doesn't feel like that to you. Hurricanes, alligators, sharks, mosquitoes, the sun itself beating down on you. Why would anyone want to live here? I'm just kidding. Uh, we We were here just a couple weeks ago and we saw a grasshopper that was this long. I'm not even kidding. We were house hunting, we had a, a morning off, and, and Jennifer and I said, hey, let's, let's go check out Wakiva Springs. We've heard great things about it. It's a beautiful place. Let's go see it for ourselves. So we go and we see the springs, and there's people that are swimming around, and it looks cool, and we see the map, and there's these trails. And we said, let's go hike a trail. And so we drive out to the end of Wakiva Springs, and we find this trail. Within 30 steps of being on the trail, I see this guy right here. I see, can you, you can't see it. I mean, this is almost life-size. That's a turtle the size of a car tire. (laughs) And for the rest of the the little three-mile hike, I kept thinking to myself, if the turtles are this big, how big are the snakes? (laughs) My head was on a swivel like I was behind enemy lines trying to avoid landmines. I mean, it's terrifying to be out in nature here. In Georgia, you have frogs and crickets. You got anacondas and stuff down here. I don't know. I'm just scared to live here a little bit. Here's the second one. In Florida, the food is different. It's not a bad thing. It's a really, really good thing. Like, uh, we've been trying out some of the local cuisine here, trying to get a feel for Florida food. Uh, We've we've been to the little Greek shop over here. That doesn't sound local, but then we went to Zaza's. It's this cube. Oh, I must have found the place. Just by the conference office, you, you know it, Orlando, yeah. Uh, and, and, and you go in there, and it's Cuban food, which Cuban food is delicious. Mmm, those beans and rice, so good. Those sweet plantains, come on, can I get a witness, somebody? Oh. So we eat our meal, and then we go for the dessert. And let me tell you, quesitos have changed my life. They're so, th- those guava pastries, oh my goodness. The next day, we ate Thai, and we went back to Zaza's to get more quesitos. They're so good. Florida food is, food is so good. 
Now here's another place. If, if, if you're not from around here, just go to these places during the week and you will change your, your life as well. Uh, there's a little place just down the road, it's called Arepas Cafe. You know this place. So here's the, this is the Google street view of it, Arepas. It, it literally is like a mile from here. You go out to 436 and turn left, and it's just there. So we, we go there because we heard it's a really good spot to eat, and we walk inside, and we sit down, and they, 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 they take our order. We ordered um, Arepas and Cachapas, and, and they bring us this plate. Now, previously, they brought us uh, a fork, a knife, and a napkin, and so they bring me this plate, and this is, this is my plate over here, this um, arepas here. Now, I've had arepas before. Am I saying that right? Do you roll the R on arepas? Ah, there's confusion today. Arepas, is that better? No, arepas. Good, arepas, okay. So they bring me these arepas. Now, I've had arepas before, but it was some friends of ours, some Venezuelan uh, friends, and they made them, and they just handed it just one little biscuit or whatever you call it, just this little arepa, and it was good, uh, but this came out differently. It came out, and it had lettuce and tomatoes, some fried plantains in there, some garlic sauce in there, some cheese, but it was wrapped in this little wrapper down below, and I'm looking at this, feeling like a gringo down here in Florida. Do you roll the R on gringo? Whatever. <laughs> The plate's there, I'm looking at it, I see my fork and my knife and my napkin, and I just wonder, how are you supposed to eat this? And so I lean my chair back to these two young high school kids behind me, and I say, hey, um, I don't mean to sound dumb here, but how do you eat this? Do you eat it with a knife and a fork, or eat it like a sandwich? And they smiled, kind of laughed before they made fun of me, and they said, you eat it like a sandwich. And what just happens is that those two boys are the sons of the mother, the owner of Arepas Cafe. There she is, that's Maria. She might be here this morning. Maria, if you're here, you're the best. I love you. In fact, I doubt she is here, but I really think that over the next weeks and months, we should just swamp Arepas Cafe with our presence. And you walk in there and you say, hey, I'm so-and-so from the Forest Lake Seventh-day Adventist Church. Our pastor said this is the best food in town. I guarantee she'd come to church. Let's do it. <laughs> now, here's the last one. And, and I'll tell you what, my wife is probably squirming in her seat because she knows what I'm going to say here. In fact, this morning as I was like, hey, here are my three points, uh, she said, ah, are you sure you want to do that third one? So I am going against wisdom here, which is definitely a bad idea, but we're going to do it anyway. You can give me forgiveness and grace. Maybe you won't remember anything that I say for the next three minutes. Florida culture is quite different. Um, I've noticed that every day, any day that ends with Y, it rains here. I, seriously, every day that we've been here, it rains. Uh, it's wet, gets humid, it's gross. Uh, it's true. But there's another part of Florida culture that is just strange to me. And it's, it's a very Hispanic thing. I've seen this my whole life, but I have avoided it because I don't understand it. And now that I live in Florida, I'm afraid that I can't avoid it. And it's this very Hispanic greeting of a kiss on the cheek. Do you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> no white people are smiling right now. <laughs> yeah. But I've got questions about this thing because, see, just a few weeks ago, we were at the conference office with Orlando and, and we met Adcom and, we, and they prayed with us and then and he walks us out to our car and we come to this overhang and we're standing there and we're, we're talking and we're laughing and we're dreaming and we're praying about Forest Lake Church and, and, and when we're ready to leave, I give him a hug and then he gives Jennifer a hug and he gives her a kiss on the cheek, which is cool, but I just don't understand it totally. <laughs> So I need to know the rules because I feel like this could lead to some very awkward situations. Like, do Hispanics, do, do white people do it? I don't know. Like, and, and when you kiss, do you only kiss on one side? Or do you do both sides? And what if you go for the same side? I mean, this is a disaster waiting to happen. And while I joke and kid about all the differences in Florida, I know, I know that God has called me and my family here to the Forest Lake Church for right here and right now. Not a shadow of a doubt in my mind. And even though it is so, so hard to leave an active, growing church in Marietta, Georgia, where God is moving, to leave that to come here. If Jeff Patterson can do it, and if God calls, we can do it too. I invite you to pray with me as we jump into the message this morning. Heavenly Father, today, this day is about you. 
It's a day honoring what you have done, what you are doing, and what you will do here at the Forest Lake Church. And I pray that over these next few moments that we uh, laugh and enjoy and dream and think and pray together, but that we will have your presence here that we can see what you are doing now. In Jesus' name, amen. Just a few weeks ago, Jen and I were riding around in Sandra De Silva's, Sandra De Silva's uh, Honda uh, Pilot. In fact, uh, Sandra decided to skip out today. She uh, had anniversary plans in Cancun. Sandra, you're probably watching right now. We miss you. You should be here, but I'm sure you're having fun. So she was taking us around, showing us some houses. And as we went up to Longwood, I've heard that's a pretty cool place. Oh, okay. We split the church over where you live. That's good. Unity. Excellent. We go to Longwood, and we, we're, we come to a traffic light at 434 and Markham Woods. You've been there. It's a big intersection. It's right by I-4. Uh, we're, we're, we're facing I-4, and if you turn left, you head up towards Markham Woods Church. And as we're sitting in the turning lanes, we see a lot of things happening. This is a big intersection. It's a four-way intersection, but there's two lanes going every way, and there are two turning lanes for every direction as well. It is a large intersection. And we, we're the very first car at this intersection in the turning lane. And as we sit there, we're talking, we're thinking, we're laughing, we're talking about different houses that we might buy, whatever. And, and we see a squirrel. He's on the curb. And he looks left and right just like his mama taught him. And he decides to cross the street right through the intersection. So he scampers out pauses, looks around a little bit, keeps going. He ends up in the middle of the intersection. And it's at this time that the light turns green for the two turning lanes that are coming at us. And he's in the middle. And he looks and he realizes that this is a problem. And so he scampers back towards the curb the other direction. But by this time, the, the oncoming car is coming straight ahead. Now the traffic is picked up. So he realizes this is a bad situation. So he turns and he scampers back the other way. And he finds himself in the middle of a precarious situation. In fact, uh, we gasp and laugh and, and, and oh, what's going to happen? Uh, Jen, she said, I swear he had his tail run over three times in that situation. Back, forth, back and forth. Finally, he makes his escape all the way back to the curb and he's fine. But if I could be a squirrel just for a moment, I believe that he was thinking this. Should I go now? What about now? Maybe I'll just wait. Maybe they won't see me. I'm going to go now. No, wait, maybe. Should, should I go later? What about right now? Now? Later? When, when should I go? He stands in an in a intersection of indecision where there's crisis unfolding all around him. His world is falling apart on him, and he doesn't know when to go. Is it now? Is it later? When should I go? Should I just stand still? The global Christian church, and most definitely the Seventh-day Adventist movement, that boldly carries the awesome and wonderful burden of the third angel's message to proclaim to the world, seems to get stuck in an intersection, a time warp of decision where we don't know when to move. And instead of shouting the battle cry of, onward Christian soldiers, we tend to sit and pray that one day God will pour out the latter rain, that one day his presence will get poured out. And we sit and we pray and we say, oh, we want to go, but we're going to wait. We want to do something special, but is it now? Is it later? When do we go? What if we get rejected? What if we don't have the words to say? What if we, what if we say something and they say, ah, oh, you're dumb. Aren't you a cult? I heard about you. In, in, in Texas, Branch Davidians, isn't that you guys? And we sit in this indecisive moment as crisis falls around us, and we don't know what to do. And instead of moving forward, the church sits and prays for God to do something. This morning, I'm convicted, I'm compelled, I am convinced that I believe we can't wait. I can't, I, I, I don't believe that we can sit and just pray for the latter rain. Just sit and pray and ask God to do something. I'm convinced and compelled and convicted that when the church moves, the latter rain falls. That when the church is active, when we put our faith in action, that's when God's power is poured out in us and through us to change the world. See, for decades and centuries and millennia, 
People have been praying for this latter rain movement. This latter rain. When's it going to happen, God? We've been praying it. From, from the prophets of old, people, Jesus lovers, have been saying, when will it come? We're looking for it, God. When is it going to happen? When will the latter rain fall? When will the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, you know him, the third part of the Trinity, the Godhead, the part that you can't see but you know he lives in your heart. When will you fall, God? When will your presence be made known? And we pray and we wait for this. Ever since even some of the prophets of old said, here's what Hosea says. Hosea says these words. He says this, let us know, let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established as the morning. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter and former rain to the earth. Hosea, he says, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach to you. This is God's message to you people. And he says to you, Forest Lake Seventh Avenue Church too. He says, this is for you. Just like the morning, God promised he will come. The morning comes every morning. You know the dawn will come. You might have a, a night of weeping, but joy comes in the morning. The morning's always there. The sun always rises. You can count on it. And Hosea says, God's promise is like that. His mercies are the same every morning. They're new every day. The morning comes every day. God says he will come just like the morning. But then Hosea goes into something different as he talks about the former rain and the latter rain. He uses farming terms to describe this outpouring of God's spirit and the outpouring of God's power. I grew up on a farm. In fact, here's some pictures of my farm that I grew up on in Greenville, Tennessee. I, I, I re-met the Seltmans this morning. Uh, I remember them from when I was just a little guy, probably about this size. You'll see it here in a minute. And uh, we lived on Buckingham Road, a beautiful little place. And uh, I, this, this farm that we lived on, here it is, yeah, in the shadow of the Appalachian Mountains over here. Um, I spent most of my days chasing cows through the field. They hated me, but this one apparently loved me. We rented this house from a lady, and she also owned all the farmland around it, and she rented that to a farmer. Here he is. His name is Mr. Miser. I don't know what his first name is, but he's a great dude, and he loved to farm. In fact, he, his crop of choice was tobacco, which was a big joke because my dad's a pastor. He, he was the pastor at the Greenville SDA Church for four and a half years, and then he was the chaplain at Tacoma Adventist Hospital for five and a half years, and everyone always joked that the pastor was growing tobacco in the backyard. <laughs> Way to go with the health message there, preacher. I guess it's better than making moonshine or something. I don't know. So Mr. Miser, he would always make or grow tobacco. And Mr. Miser, as a farmer, he understood what Hosea is talking about, the, lat the former rain and the latter rain. He could set his calendar by this because at a certain time in the year, he knew the rain is coming. It's time now. So he would get his, his tractor, he'd get his plow, he'd get the disker, and he would... He would plow up the soil and get it all ready, prepared. He'd put the tobacco seeds in and the rains would come. And the, the former rain would come and it would make the, the ground moist. The seeds would grow and germinate and you'd have plants. But he also would look forward to the latter rain because he knew it would be coming. He knew he had to be ready. And his crops would, would either be a success or a failure depending on the rain. And so as he waits for the latter rain, he's thinking, when that rain falls, I know it's time for me to collect the harvest. And Hosea, he speaks in these farming terms as he describes the falling of God's presence and power on humanity. He says there's a former rain and there's a latter rain. Two different events, two different separate things that happen. You can count on it. One happened, the other one will happen too. In his time, in Hosea's time, these farmers, they knew that, that the first rain, the former rain, would happen in October and November. But they knew that the latter rain would happen in April or March. And so they would make sure they get the crops in before the former rain happens so that they could have a good harvest when the latter rain happens. This second rain would happen in March and April and they're ready to, to collect the harvest. You could count on it. You could bank on it. You knew when the rain would fall. And ever since the first time that the Spirit rained down, God's presence, ever since the first time, the whole world waits and watches for the second time. See, that first time that the Spirit rained down is my favorite story in the Bible. Uh, maybe Jesus' story is even better than that. But it may be the best story of the New Testament church. It's in Acts chapter 2. If you've got your Bibles, you can look there with me. I'll have it on the screen today. Uh, just so you know, I don't like uh, just having Scripture on the screen. I really like us using our own Bibles just because it's powerful to pick up God's Word and just read it for yourselves, not just because I have it printed somewhere. Uh, but today you can cheat. We'll give you a pass. It's okay. One of my favorite stories is in one of my favorite books in the Bible. It's Acts. Acts chapter 2. You see a, a group of believers. They're new Christians. They've just uh, understood the gospel. And they're, they're excited about what's happening. And so they're gathered in this upper room. And it's not 12 disciples. It's the group of people. It's a growing group. They're, they're a little bit larger now. And they're in this room and they're praying. 
They're praying for the promise of what Jesus has already promised them. Jesus says, I'm not going to leave you alone. There's someone coming. He's the comforter. He's the counselor. He's the, he's the one that will be with you always. You can count on him. He's coming. And so they, they sit in this room and they pray and they say, God, we're ready. Send him to us. We're ready for that power and that presence. They don't know what they're praying for. They just know it's going to be awesome. And as they're kneeling, I don't know, maybe they're in a circle, maybe they're holding hands, they're praying, and as they pray, they hear this sound of rushing wind. I imagine it's like this freight train that comes barreling in. It's this loud noise, like, like a hurricane coming through Florida. And they hear this noise, and everybody, like a 10-year-old at the dinner table, they open one eye to look around, and they see what looks like tongues of fire above their heads, and they're empowered with the Holy Spirit. You know the rest of the story. They feel his presence, and so they walk outside. The people of the city have all gathered because they heard the sound of wind as well. And so they go outside, and, and this crowd has gathered, and they, they don't know what to do. They're not sure what to say. And so they preach the thing that they know and love the most. They preach the gospel. They share of a God of the universe that loves humans so much that he became one of us to die for us so that we can be with him forever. And as they preach the story of Jesus people's lives are changed. In fact, in Acts chapter 2, in verse 37, we're just going to read a couple of verses today. Here's what happened. Acts chapter 2, verse 37. Here's what it says in my Bible. When the people heard this, the gospel message, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? They feel it. They know what's going on. And they say, what do, what do we do now? What's the next step in this discipleship process? How do I have a deeper relationship with the person that I'm just experiencing for the first time? What do we do? Peter says this, verse 38. Peter replied, he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He says, this is awesome. You guys want to know what's happening in us? You can be a part of this too. You can have this pouring of a divine God inside you as well. Take the Holy Spirit too. Verse 41, here's the results. You know this well. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Guys, this is the story that people yearn and long to be about. This is the stuff where they say, I want to be a part of that church, the one that the Holy Spirit is just filling the people, and it's so full that it goes out to the community. This is what I want to be a part. This is what people yearn to be about. A perfect God that joins hand in hand with sinful humans to do something that's unbelievable. This is the story of the former reign. There's a part of the story that you can't miss. In fact, it's not even in the story, so you can't even find it. But it's while that group is praying. And as they're there, holding hands, as they're praying for God's presence to be given to them through the Holy Spirit... They sense his presence, and here's what they don't do. They don't look around at each other and say, well, that was cool. They don't say, oh, let's keep praying. Let's keep praying. Maybe he'll give us some more. Maybe if we just pray, maybe this Holy Spirit will go out the doors and talk to people for us. Maybe God's presence is so big that we'll, we'll, just, we'll, just, we'll just sit here. Should we go now? I don't know. Maybe later. What, what if we go out there and we don't know what to say? Uh, what if we go out there and we say the wrong thing? What if I don't know all those memory verses that I remember from Sabbath school? Like, what do I do? They didn't just sit there. They went outside and they shared the gospel with someone else. I fully believe that God's Holy Spirit moves when the church moves. We sit and we wait for him to do something. And I wonder, I wonder if he waits for us to do something. We pray for him to outpour his spirit on us, but I wonder if it's in our hands. Because I fully believe that when the church moves, when we put our faith in action, that's when the spirit is poured out through us. In fact, one of my favorite all-time authors, authors uh, you know her well, Ellen White. She writes a lot about this movement and about God's presence. In fact, she writes these words in a, in a magazine that you all get, probably, the Review and Herald, except she wrote it 130 years ago. She says these words. She says, when the churches become living, working churches, 
the Holy Spirit will be given in answer to their sincere request. Then the windows of heaven will be, will be opened for the showers of the latter rain. Did you hear it? I'm going to read it again. I was, I was preaching one time um, in Marietta, actually, and there's this, this little old black lady. She's the coolest lady ever. I love her. Her name is Josephine. I call her Miss Jo. She, she sits kind of over here. And I read something one time, and she said, Say it again, preacher! <laughs> Here it is again, just in case you missed it. She says this, When the churches become living, working churches, the Holy Spirit will be given in answer to their sincere request. Then the windows of heaven will be opened for the showers of the latter rain. Man, that tells me something. It tells me something that when the church moves, when the church is on God's mission. The Holy Spirit goes in us and through us and is poured out because of what we're doing. Are you hearing me, church? When we are on his mission, the Holy Spirit comes. In fact, Jesus says it best as he says it in the Great Commission. Here's what it says, Matthew 28. Uh, you know this verse. He says, all authority, it's the same word in Greek as power, exousia, all authority and power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And he says, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. If Jesus has all the power, if he has all the authority, and he says, I'll be with you always, what are we waiting on? Let's go do something. Let's be on his mission and watch him change lives through us. And I believe this. In fact, I've seen this. I've seen this, haven't even been here yet, but I've seen this church, the Forest Lake Seventh-day Adventist Church, already on God's mission. In fact, I've seen it so clearly in the pastors that you have here. Y'all, we may have the greatest pastoral staff in any church in the world. I see Pastor Julie Every week, I've been watching y'all's service for a long time. I see Pastor Julie on God's mission every week as she exudes God's love for people, as she connects with people in person and on the screen. I see Pastor Jeremy. I see him on mission as he uses music as a way to usher people to the feet of Jesus. I see Pastor Sonia, who absolutely works her heart out Y'all, I don't know if you know Pastor Sonia, this girl is a workhorse. That's a good thing, right? A beautiful, sweet workhorse. That's, I got to find a different phrase. She works a lot. She's a hard worker. But she's on God's mission as she works with our, 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 our middle school range and our pathfinders and our adventurers. She's, she's just working with them to help them become greater disciples. I see our pastors on mission. I see Pastor Jennifer on mission all the time as she diligently thinks of ways to help children and family become disciples and disciple makers. I see, I see uh, Pastor Candy on mission as she works with people, as she counsels them, as she listens to them, people that are hurting, people that need help, and she works with them as she shares the gospel with them. I see Pastor Steve as he ministers to seniors, and as he visits, and as he connects with people. He's on God's mission. He's sharing the gospel in all that he does. I see Pastor Juan as he confidently is on God's mission, as he, as he does everything that he can, behind the scenes, in front, guitar, preaching, whatever it is, to help Warehouse Community succeed. I see Pastor Mark on mission, as this guy is so passionate about youth and discipleship that it exudes out of him uh, like everything. I see Pastor Justin as he shares his love for Christ in music. Y'all, I don't know if you realize this. Pastor Justin was here yesterday at 7.30 in the morning. He left after me, and I left about 11 o'clock last night. Um, he's been here all day. He was here this morning when I got here. Uh, and all the pastors have been here a ton. I'm just thinking of Pastor Justin, this guy. Dude, you need, you need a two or three day vacation with the wife and the family. Yes, his wife is, is nodding. Yes, he does. <laughs> I see Pastor Tim on mission as he works and leads in an administrative role as he is the, our executive pastor. Did I get all the pastors? Raise your hand if I didn't because this could be very embarrassing. Whew. I see the church on mission. In fact, I see it in other ways too. I see it in volunteers. Uh, that's you. 
I see it in people that drive golf carts. I got a ride from the church over here today. Sorry if you didn't, but I'm really glad I did because I would have been a soaking mat, wet mess if I hadn't. That's a volunteer. The, the greeters, the AV, the live stream, everybody that serves here on God's mission, how can we share Jesus with the community? How can we share Jesus with someone else? I see it. I see the church on mission through Advent Health as you have doctors and nurses and custodians and food service personnel and administrators who all want to extend the healing ministry of Christ to the, to the world. It's a giant mechanism and organization, but it has one purpose, and that is to heal people holistically so that they can heal physically as well as spiritually. I see this church on mission through Forest Lake Elementary, oh, uh, Fleece, let's just stop there. Forest Lake Education Center, thank you, not elementary. Uh, Fleece and Forest Lake Academy, two wonderful schools united with one cause and one purpose, and that is to uh, train and, and, um, and help young people know Jesus and to be disciple makers. I see it in what's happening in our church this, in two weeks, two weeks, the 31st, Jennifer, am I right? Hands and feet. Two weeks? The last Sabbath of this month. <laughs> if you haven't signed up, then you need to, because apparently I need to as well and get the date straight. But I see it because this church is on his mission, active, moving, growing, trying our best to share the love of Jesus, to live the gospel with somebody else. And I believe that as our church is on the move, beyond the walls of a building, beyond the gates around the campus, as we live the gospel, I believe that people will come to know him because the Holy Spirit is poured out in us and through us. This morning I want to close with one of my all-time favorite quotes. It's a, a quote that is buried in my heart uh, because it challenges me. Um, Ellen White, she writes in Christ Object Lessons, she says this, as the will of man cooperates with the will of God, it becomes omnipotent. That's all powerful if you didn't know what that word is. Whatever is to be done at his command may be accomplished in his strength. All his biddings are enablings. Forest Lake Church, I don't know what God's going to do. It's going to be awesome. He's already been doing things. He's doing it now, and I believe he will continue to do awesome things. And as we are more and more on his mission, as we are more and more putting our faith into action, I believe his spirit will be poured out through us and that starting here, we will change the world as we draw people to Jesus. I can't wait to see what he will do. Welcome home.